Um, the Ghana government has, for two decades back, attempted to do uh, read through a lot of hospitals. And in the private sector, so have also invested hugely in hospital equipment. And so we know that there have been installations, but we wanted to find out the state of the equipment uh, after 20 years. And then also find out which percentage of the people in the population have access to MRI cells. So, and we all know the benefits that MRI cells has, both for diagnosis, for research, and for diagnosis not only for reviewing structural changes, but also for functional and the chemical changes in the body. And so, with all these benefits, we also know there's also the huge cost, like we already discussed here. If we think of high field, then there's also the huge cost of the cost of the machine itself, installation, maintenance, issue with helium, issue with shelling or cooling system. So, uh, the idea of the organizers of this program and then others in trying to get new fields uh, installed in our hospitals in our countries to make them accessible to our people is good. So, like I said, so we wanted to find out the personality of the MRI equipment in Ghana but at the year 2020, that's 20 years after the government policy of returning hospitals and then the private sector's investment in MRI. So we carried out a simple survey, a national survey, sent out questionnaires to various MRI centers and found out from the availability of uh, qualified people as professionals, radiologists, radiographers, and then also the cost of the examination, <coughs> also uh, when the equipment was installed, it state whether it was functional at the time of the survey, whether it was down, and then if it had been down, for how long has it been down? So we asked all this, so we analyzed the results. So here you have a table uh, showing, at that time there were 18 MRI installations in the country and 13 of them, 14 were high for 1.5 Tesla, there was only 1.3 Tesla and then 4 low for 0.3 Tesla and then you can see here of installations as we shown here and as you can see from the table to at the time of the study, 4 of the MRI equipment in state owned facilities were not functioning. And some had been down for D3 and then four years. So over here I've tried to try to put down the number of Ghana. Ghana now has 16 administrative regions. So we looked at the responses from the survey and then placed the MRI installations over the regions. So map of Ghana showing the various administrative regions and then the population, uh, land area, and then the number of MRI equipment. So some have greater coverage, that's where the capital is located. It has 12 MRI installations at the time of the study. Uh, Ashanti region, which follows with a population of about 6 million, had three MRI installations. And then the northern part of the country, apart from northern, which had one MRI installation, the rest of the regions in the northern region had no MRI installation. So I put down the summary. Uh, so 1, 3, 13, 1.5, and then 4 low flows at the time of the examination. And then we can also see that out of the 18, the 18 MRI were serving about 32 million people at the time of the study. That's 2020 estimate. We had our census last year, the population was around 32 million now. So this gave us 0.6 machines to a million population. Yeah. And then also, out of only 5 out of the 16 had MRI installation. And these 5 regions had a population, 57% of the population at the time. And then the 16 regions which had no MRI population had 43% of the population. 
So we also saw that not only the numbers of the population, but the land area, because we have to take into consideration if there is an MRI installation here, another MRI installation at another region, how far would the people have to travel in order to access MRI service? So 11 out of the 16 regions that didn't have MRI provision covered 70% of the land area of Ghana. And then the 15, the 15 MRI installations, 15 out of the 18 MRI installations were located in only two regions. That's the Shanti region and then the Greater Accra region. Two regions out of 16. Two regions out of 16 had 15 of the 18 installations. And only five. Only five regions out of the 16 had MRI installations, like in 20. This study was in 2020. So, we also looked at the cost of the examination, and as it was expected, the cost of the examination were higher in the private owned health facilities compared to the public facilities. Now, the least examination costs 700 to Ghana cities at the time. The main cost of spine examination was several million to Ghana cities at the time, which was translated to about $140 at the time. Okay, and then the highest was um, $109,095 Ghana cities, which translated to about $170 at the time. So we also looked at like I said, four out of the installations, the 15 installations, were not functional at the time of the study. So we asked, for how long have they been down? And then, considering the times they've been down, and also taking into consideration the average cost of examination that they were performed, because from each facility, we asked or found out which examination they were carrying out, and the cost of the examination we at the end of the day we could. Uh, calculate the revenue that they were generating per week. So if the machine had been down for three years, we could calculate how much revenue had been lost by the machine or the MR equipment being down. So this from the four equipment which had been down at the time of the study, the total revenue loss was 36 million, over 36 million galaxies, which translated to over 7 million US dollars. So, machine has been down. Right now, we are looking at only the cost, not taking into consideration the a clinical effect on the patients. How many lives have been lost, and then cases becoming complicated, and so on. So, we made this uh, conclusions from the study, and from what we did. The MRI study was not accessible to many of the population we already. Settings. Five out of 16 regions have been around installations. And then uh, we also realized that upsurge in the installation within that 20 years was due to the government's program and also the private sector. And the private man always wants his money. So they will all only install, make sure the machines are located where there's commercial activity where he's going to get uh, his returns. Okay, and then like we've already stated, the downtime of the four equipment had cost the nation or the owners of the equipment over 7.7 million US dollars. So this information is made available to the Ghana government, the Ghana Health Service, and also those who are interested in investing in MRI equipment. That's, they have to make sure that there should be more investments installations so that this MRI service will be accessible to the public. So this comes to was emphasized what the organizers of the program is making sure that uh, instead of going for the high field installations which though have their benefits but at the end of the day you are going to have problems we have problems with power we have problems with maintenance we have problems with acquiring this equipment and at the end of the day translating to people not in how people not having access to the minimal examination because um, when we looked at the examinations that were performed, we just considered the basic ones, head 
MRI with without contrast-spine MRI because these are the most common MRI is that these better perform perfusion, cardiac, and poor media. Just few about 10 percent of the examinations that are carried out. So this way, some of the findings from the MRI installation. I don't know whether. Start with uh, analysis here, like sh okay, sh okay. Let me check for that. Okay. okay. So first, uh, I want to know a little bit more about you all, um, and then we go into safety. And maybe some people expected to hear that I am going to tell you. My patient has a vascular clip in the head. Is that safe? Yes or no? Well, we come to that. But MRI safety is so much broader. And if you want to do safe MRI, uh, other things are really important too. So that's why I'm also going to talk about how the layout of the department is, but also about the background of the sources of risk. Because the thing is, like, as soon as you don't know what's inside your patient, you need to figure it out for yourself whether it's safe or not. And then you need to know the background. So, there we go. Who am I? My name is Walter Tavisha. Originally, but well, that's a long time ago, I've been talking about the late 80s, I was trained as a radiographer. So, any questions for radiographers are more than welcome. Because I always feel a bit like one of the same kind. Uh, after that I started doing research, I was a teacher in uh, X-ray technology and also in uh, radiation protection. And later I switched to research on CT first. In the last 20 years I've been working with MRI. Um, okay, and just to kind of get the notion out of the, of the way that I'm an expert, I'm an expert, but I definitely have limitations in the sense that my entire MRI career I've worked only with superconductive high field magnets. And especially in the field of safety, it gets a bit a different realm if you go to an impermanent magnet and open scanner. But we'll get to that. So then I want to know who are you? So are there any break of uh, radiographers in the audience? Okay. Uh, radiologists? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, there's, there's more. Um, engineers? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, any other disciplines? Yeah. Researchers? There's at least a couple there. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, okay. Just to get a, a feeling of what uh, questions I may uh, need to answer. So, uh, who among you is working with MRI on a weekly or daily basis? Mm -hmm. Of course, you get now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More at least. You used to, so you have the experience, but okay then. And then, for those that work with MR, what is the field strength of your equipment? 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla. Excuse me? 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla also. 1.5. 1.5. 1. 1. 3. 1. 3. 1. 1. 5. Good, 3. 0.3. Good, 3. That's, that's really <laughs> and those are all superconductive magnets, right? Mine is 0.3. That's a permanent uh, magnet, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, 2 million to 7. Excuse me? 50 million years ago, so... Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's <laughs> I'm at the uh, extreme end of the spectrum, because uh, I'm the, the manager of the, the 7 Tesla scanner in our uh, building, and also, of course, I'm working with Tom O'Reilly on the 50 millitesla. So that's really way off in either direction. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, then. Um, who of you encountered an incident with your MR scan that posed a risk to either the patient, personnel, or 
the equipment. Here, what, what happened? So we, we had a patient, and then the patient came in a wheelchair, not MRI compatible wheelchair. And the colleague who was attending to the patient had been working always. I don't know what happened to him. He didn't do his check list well. So he wheeled the patient into the MRI room. And then as soon as the patient got off the wheelchair, <laughs> the wheelchair was forcibly yeah. attracted to the mind. Yeah. And he, his understanding of the whole thing was that. So he said, I should help him to pull. <laughs> ah, okay, sure. Now, this is very interesting because, well, you know, a story. Yeah. Okay. The wheelchair should not be taken into the MRI room for obvious reasons. Um, although there are MRI safe uh, examples, I have a picture of one of those. And that's a company, they also make these, these stands for infusion uh, liquids. To, and to my amazement, what they made it of is just simple PVC piping that you use in the sewers. And that's what we started to use as well, to build rigs for uh, scientific experiments. You just go to do the, the do-it-yourself shop and you buy some PVC material. You start gluing it together. But if something get stuck onto the scanner. As you said, try to get it off. How successful were you? No, no. It's not, not a chance. Not at all. Well, I will give you an example later in the presentation what might happen. And I hope I can convince you never ever start pulling an object in the I saw another hand raised in the back. Uh, yeah. yeah, what time? Uh, I to get a skull fixture so that we would have a mosquito jacket to fix. Right. Um, did you end up seeing uh, a huge scar uh, on the surface of the, the pin Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And okay. And that was the back door of another uh, subject. A female, 24 years, you had to one and a half and you made this wide, yeah. fresh ink. Yeah. And what is the uh, By the time we started the thing in the day, she, she actually started complaining of the old feelings in the back. Right. She's very lucky. Yeah. Pulled it out. Yeah. After to check again, it's a questionnaire. Yeah. And then had to revise the safety, what we need to do. Uh, that was more than two centimeters. Because I think some of these statues are even. Okay. okay. Good. So these are two examples. Um, okay. Later on, uh, during the presentation, we might discuss uh, these examples as well because they're really interesting. Uh, both of them, anyway. Um, but there was a hand raised there. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, maybe if, if you're not medically trained, um, the example of uh, a spine back there for stereotactic permission, it, it's a bit of a horror story if you're not used to it. People with a brain tumor. If they want to really target it well, what they do is they require, acquire an MRI image of the brain. But uh, during the MRI scan and also during the operation, they mount a frame, a metal frame to the head. And how do you do that? Yeah, it sounds a bit horrid, but they simply drill four screws into your skull and they mount the frame to that. It may be known to you as an external fixture. They also do it for very complicated fractures of arms or legs, but the bones cannot be put together again. They drill holes on either side of the fracture and mount bars between them to stabilize the fracture. Those are particularly risky. How come? I will explain to you that. And 
Okay, no, I, I'm, I'm running ahead of schedule. So, incidents do happen, right? And we all know it. Hence this, uh, this lecture. Okay, then. So, first of all, how safe is your department? And what do you need to take in, uh, in, into consideration? So, the layout, where are the rooms, what path do the patients follow is very important. Um, what training does your personnel get and what kind of equipment do you use? Now, about the layout, um, I'm not going to tell it all. Because there's this document by the American College for Radiology. And in 2008, they published the first version. In 2013, it was revised. All the information you need is in there. Really, really a, a very nice um, paper if you want to kind of catch up on the rules and regulations and ideas about how to be safe in your uh, MR environment. Um, if, if you want, please feel free to take pictures of the, uh, of the screen uh, to get all these uh, references up. So, the basis of a safe department is they propose it, is that the entire MR area from the patient entering the hospital up to entering the MR uh, room is divided into four sections. And this division is made by the level of safety. And of course, because I'm, I'm showing it here, you cannot read it, but I enlarged it a bit. So, safety level one is the public area. The subjects may just walk around without being screened for any implant or wall. Then you come to the next. So this is an area where uh, the patients are not supervised by, um, by any personnel of the radiology, um, but they also should not be able to get into an area where there is increased risk. So the next level is level two, and that's on the radiology department, where the reception is, and that's the first contact with the patient. So that could be the area where you ask for the, for the questionnaire. So a list of questions to try and get information about uh, what implants might be uh, present. And there, of course, the supervision by the radiology department starts. If only by the people from the reception desk, uh, but it could also be closer to the management already. So, level three is a waiting area, but only for patients that were already screened. So, someone that knows a bit more MR safety, so any of the MR personnel, should have gone through the questionnaire with the patient and checked if everything is okay. And last but not least, of course, then you have the MRI room itself. And that's, of course, uh, clearly the danger zone. Now, one can draw a clear line between these regions. And the first two patients are probably not screened yet. But when they pass from zone two to three, they are screened. And the good thing is, if patients are screened, we know they don't have any implants that pose risk. And also, they empty the pockets and they wear clothing that is safe. They basically can keep walking around. They want to keep eye on them, but they cannot do that. A question. I have a question. For patient, patients who's, who are mentally ill, they can't answer the questionnaires and interviews. Sorry, but not yet. For patients who yeah. are mentally ill yeah. and can't mm. see the interview. That's a good one. But they are safe. Yeah. Thank you for this question. So, for patients that are mentally ill, it can also be for patients that are unconscious. In other words, patients that cannot respond to any questions. Excellent question. Thanks. Um, that's a problem, especially uh, around the emergency department, uh, or indeed with uh, uh, people that cannot properly answer your questions. In the latter situation, you only can get the information from the parents or someone from the institute where this patient is, is living. But you need to realize it's second-hand information from the patient 
him on the shelf, you won't get it. So there is already a dependency entering the entire procedure, right? For uh, uh, subjects that are unconscious, yeah, that's a real, real problem. Maybe there's family that knows more, a spouse maybe know about the history of operations, but especially patients that were brought in after an accident or that got wounded uh, during uh, a fight. It's very difficult to know whether there's any metal fragments or such in there. And the only thing you then can do if an MRI is really necessary is take it place and see whether you can find any metal Thanks. So, um, yeah. This is how they propose uh, the layout. And as you can see, they say like, okay, our patient walks in here, enters some one this waiting room there. They are not screened yet, but they give their form to these people here that might send it to the MRI people that then judge it. Here, when it's the turn for this patient to be called, they go to some uh, to their new change. In our hospital, we ask all the, all the patients that are to be scanned to swap their own trousers for uh, pyjamas from the hospital for the very simple reason there are no pockets in those trousers so we know there's nothing in the pocket uh, what we also ask is that the clothing they wear uh, doesn't contain any metal sometimes it's these t-shirts with fancy prints on it that glitter glitter is many 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 times glitter contains metal you don't want it may destroy your image quality, but what might be even worse, if those fragments are pulled off the t-shirt by the magnet, you get contamination of the magnet by all these particles. And that you don't want. So, they come in, here they change, they are screened, and then they are allowed to some three, maybe wait, and then they can be turned into the magnet. Now, also of influence is the layout of the MR room itself. And these are two examples from uh, my department. Uh, here, this is the Zetin uh, Tesla scanner. It doesn't look different from uh, uh, the 1.5 Tesla. But the point I want to make is from the doorstep up to the scanner, it's something like it's a distance of something like 15 meters. If you enter this room, and you have a, a key ring in your pocket, you start entering this room and then you go, hmm, this is, this is. <laughs> then you go like so. You have time, you get a warning, and there's a, there's a chance you escape the disaster. This is a three Tesla scanner, and the side or the corner of this uh, scanner is only a meter and a half away from the door. That is a particularly nasty situation because with one big step, you're in the danger zone. So if you enter this room with something in your pocket, say a pair of scissors, 99% chance that it will slam into the back. So there's also something to consider. What is the situation in your uh, department? And do I need to take extra care before people enter the room? Okay. And then there's this, like what you see here is a three Tesla scanner in, in our department and you see here the, uh, the desk where we uh, do, the, do the actual scanning as you see from the images. But in the background there, looking through the window, you see a bit of the patient bed and there is someone standing in the door open waving. So the silly situation is that if you are here using the scanner, the moment that someone steps into the room is the first chance you get to observe somebody entering the room. And if that person is carrying something like you know, a walkie-talkie or is someone from the hospital, uh, the technicians that comes to check on the air conditioning in the room, they have safety shoes with steel noses. If they walk in here, by the time you get them, they are already dangling from the scanner. Right? So that's a bit of a thing. Now, what you cannot see now is that 
this particular monitor is hooked up to a camera that is pointing at this door. And then you think like, oh, okay, if someone walks up to this door, I will see it. Not, because this was one single picture taken at a given moment. And you see, we have two, speed, uh, two people standing in the door opening, and this is the door. No one there. So what happened here is that for some reason, completely alone, somebody at a certain point in time pushed the freeze button on the screen. And of course it's a trick what you see in movies like Mission Impossible or stuff like that. You freeze the image and people think like, okay, nothing is happening. And the default, nothing is happening, nothing is happening, and people walk in. So this is an advice if you hook up such a system. If there is a freeze button on there, disable it. So you, run in, you don't run into it. Okay. Yeah, then already uh, mentioned. This is your situation, right? <laughs> um, if you use a chair like this, uh, then you can walk in there. Yeah, the unfortunate thing, of course, is it takes a bit of money to buy such a device. That may be a big thing. Um, there's hardly any other way. Well, there is another way. Because all those scanners do have the option of lowering the bed, putting it on, a, on some carrier device, and wheel it out of the uh, scanner room, so the tabletop. So if you don't have an MR safe wheelchair, what you should do is put the coil on the tabletop, lower the bed, write the entire tabletop outside the MR, uh, MR suite, put your patient in on the bed and then bring it back in because that particular device is MRs. Uh, MRs. So, what I'm not trying to, to start is the way of thinking that all these tiny procedures that take place on a daily basis are given attention in a way you sit down and think like, okay, what's happening during the day? What is the best, what is the safest way of doing this? And then you put up a small protocol and people should be trained. And that's really, really So, just to make sure uh, any information you get from a manufacturer is, is, is clear, these are the international labels that are used. So this green square with MR safe means that a particular device can be taken into an MRI room without any risks. And of course the, the bottom one is uh, MR unsafe, a pair of scissors made of steel. And the thing is like the description is the green one that's no hazard at all. So optics fully made from plastic. Uh, glass, wood, anything that is not metallic and not attracted to the sky, that's safe. MR conditional means you cannot just take it into the room. Well, given certain conditions, it is allowed. But the trick is that you know the exact conditions that make it allowable. And that's the area where the most mistakes are made. Now, and are unsafe, that's the, that's the easiest one. Because if you have a strong magnet, and don't take a magnet that's on the whiteboard, that's, those are completely not suited to test it. Uh, the simplest uh, magnet you can use that's really very strong is a uh, magnet out of a hard disk. Disk drive, those are really strong if you get such a magnet from uh, a device that was. Uh, out of date, you know, almost thrown away. You can test it with that or any neodymium magnets. If they stick to the magnet, they don't go into the room. The other one, MR Safe, looks really simple, but you have to be cautious because indeed a standard pen, you take it in your hand, so a ballpoint, and you click it. It looks safe, when there's no metal clip on there, it's full. Only plastic, you see. 
but the little spring that allows you to click in, click out. Springs are always attracted by the magnet. Also, springs in the clip that you might put in your hair always magnetic. So you should be taken into it. Yeah, and the center category, certain conditions that are by far the most complicated. If I were to make a rough estimate, am I safe? Maybe something like 5 to 10 percent of daily stuff. Am I unsafe? Maybe 10 percent or 15 percent. Conditional, something like 80 percent. So that's why I'm going to tell you about the backgrounds uh, later on. So you can judge how to deal with all these conditions. Okay, I, yeah, you cannot underestimate how important it is to train your personnel. And there's lots of things that are important. Uh, what we do, people in our institute are only allowed to work in an MR if they at least follow a MR safety training that takes three hours. So it's not too much, I would say. Um, and in that particular training, we practice a medical emergency for the patient. And what I need to stress is during a medical uh, emergency situation becomes hectic, people start running around, maybe uh, panicking, and that's particularly the situation that the door to the scanner is left open, and when a doctor rushes in, well, I'm not sure how it is here, but I do my guess would be that a doctor here in Africa is not different from a doctor in, in, in the Netherlands in the sense that they wear a coat and uh, all kinds of stuff is in here. Like this little flashlight to look in your eyes or ears or a stethoscope, keys, pens, you name it. If you rush in with a coat full of this, if you rush into a 1.5 or a 3 Tesla room, it will all fly out and everyone that is standing between the coat and a magnet will be fired upon with all these items. So, in our institute, only MRI personnel is allowed inside the scanner room, and that's why they are trained to do this evacuation of the patient that gets acutely ill, to evacuate the patient, and they always do it within 30 seconds. You can do it real quick, but only if you practice it regularly. So, in the MR room, only MR personnel, you get your patient out, the door is locked, and then the medical emergency team, the doctors that rush in, can do their work. So, we do a hands-on practice. Um, another thing, of course, not to do, but to tell people how to do it, is quenching your magnet. And this is only available for superconductive magnets, with and there is procedures, either you push a button or you have to unscrew a lid that is somewhere in the front of the packet um, to let the magnetic field ramp down, as we call it. Be aware that if you push such a button on 1.5 Tesla, it takes about 30 seconds um, before the field is completely gone. On 3 Tesla, it might take a minute and a half. So it's not that you push a button and everybody can rush in and you have to wait for a while. Yeah, then of course the general evacuation. Suppose there's a fire, where do you go? Um, and really, really important, this, this, this is our fundament on the, the safety. The door to the scanner room is always closed. Always, always, always closed. When there's someone inside, it's not locked, it's closed. When there's someone inside the patient, there needs to be always an MR personnel uh, person present that has an eye on the door. And if that door is always closed, and if you do this, the doorstep is a door stop, anyone who opens the door is stopped on the doorstep, and you check whether that person is safe. It can be a, a, a person with a pacemaker. Uh, it can be someone, someone a nurse, that is accompanying a patient that has a perfusion pump ready to go. Um, 
is to check everybody that tries to enter the room for MR compatibility for the person and for the equipment and for the knowledge carrier. Of course, if you keep on checking that for everybody all the time, it becomes really an attitude. And if you were to visit our department, you will see that if the door is open, everybody stops and is doing and looks at the door. And the people that want to go, they always go. Always have this mantra of touching all the places where you might have pockets to check that they're going to. And we do not allow people to have anything in their pockets, also not a handkerchief or a plastic cone or such, because we want people to get used to having nothing in their pockets. Because that's much easier to think of like so that you feel like there is something there and you take it out. If you allow for little plastic things to be in the pockets, they go like so and they think, oh, that's my home. And accidentally, it was a knife from the cafeteria. So, if you are really strict on this, uh, well, I must say, on the 7 Tesla, it's now there for 14 years, zero results. Because of this. And the strange thing is that in the area of our department where the research scanners are, hardly any accidents. And if the door to the scanner room is open and left open, everybody becomes nervous. I cannot work, in, uh, work inside an MR room with the door open. I get totally nervous because I can't do my job because I have to watch the door. My message is if you are trained as such, becomes a second nature. The silly thing is, in our clinical department, some practical practicalities have been taken over, and quite often the door is left open because it's easier to just quickly walk on that. Excellence that happen, always up there. <laughs> because they use the door open. The nurse walking in with a fusion device. People from the anesthesiology department such. Okay? Ah, uh, yeah. And I have an example later on about ferromechanic objects like ordinary chairs, uh, waste paper bins, stuff like that shouldn't be present directly in the facility of the, of the MR door at least. Because before you know it, people take it and bring it in and then have a major accident. So, yeah. And then the biggest problem of all is human nature. Try to find human nature. That's really difficult. And I'm not sure whether it's clear enough for you, but here, this is an open space. This is like a couple of meters this direction. There's the chairs where the patients are waiting to be called to the MR room, but they are not screened yet. This is a door that only allows for a patient, an inpatient with a bed, to be moved towards the scanner. Should be closed this always. But if you want to push in the bed on your own, you bump into the door. So the little hooks was made. And there, there it starts. This door needs to be closed, but there's a little hook there. And for example, if the cleaner comes in in the morning, open the door, put the hook there, because if they walk out, they cannot get, uh, go back in again. So they put the hook on there, so the door is open. There goes your safety. And this is the area, and this door gives access to the MR room. And it's also open. And this picture I took, just passing by, seeing these doors open. So with this, a patient that is sitting here, and especially a patient that uh, an MR scan made previously, and knows the way. May think like, oh, I know what you go, and it just moves way to the uh, market. Human nature is really, really difficult to fight. And this is one of the, uh, another example. Uh, three tests of scanner. This was not in our uh, hospital, but in uh, another Dutch hospital. What you see there is a bit of an old shape, but it's a metal waste paper bin. And what happens, um, chances are a bit larger on a three Tesla machine, that the patient that was scanned there became dizzy because of the magnetic field and started to vomit. And the MR tech ran out, grabbed his paper bin and rushed in. So the patient would vomit in, in, in the 
is paper business. <laughs> yeah, it never happened. <laughs> but it went bang into the magnet, and luckily the patient was already sitting on the bed. But if the patient would have been on it or still in the magnet, then you have a serious injury. And that's why I say, like, keep such uh, items out, out, out of the way. Was it good with you? It was a, a, a waste in Yeah, but it was mid time Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, it was the second MRI. Yeah, it was standing next to the uh, uh, control desk, which was next to the door. So, yeah, but we do it. It's, it's, it's only plastic things are allowed. And even then, you must be careful because you, who knows exactly what's inside a bin like that. And if you rush in and get something with something metal in there, you will find out as soon as you come close to the magnet. You're the nature. And, and I'm not talking about the medical emergency, but someone that needs to vomit, right? Just imagine what happens if someone has a heart attack. This is another example. Uh, in the background, up there, you see those uh, MR coils. So, these bars here. And they are pretty heavy. And if you work there all day, you have to remove them and put them on the bed or put them there. <laughs> you feel your spine at the end of the bed, right? Because these can weigh something like 10 kilograms or so. And to my astonishment, this card was kind of traveling around on the MR department, but this is all steel. And even more to my amazement, it was one of the most experienced MR techs that worked already 20 years with MR that thought like, okay, I'm going to get this uh, coil from the other the scanner to this scanner, put it on this table and just went in. Okay, it looks pretty innocent, but the card is here. But as you may appreciate, it's not on four legs anymore. It's kind of stuck up there. You cannot get rid of You cannot get rid of There's quite a bit of damage. My message is, don't trust people because they work a long time with them on so they know what's safe. It's all human nature. It's or early in the morning, you didn't have uh, any coffee or tea yet, or a bit drowsy. Okay, so I also would advise you to think out of the box. And this is really a strange phenomenon because you see the hallway here, it's a couple of stories in our, in our uh, building, and the black painted windows there, that's the outside of one of the three Tesla buildings. And one day, we entered the hospital and saw the, the huge scaffolding built up. And here, there's a guy there, and he was working on something on the, of the facade in the building there. And I thought, this is really close to the scanner actually, because the scanner is here, and this guy was sitting there. Uh, so we went out with a field probe, and we measured the magnetic field at that particular location to be one between 1 and 1.5 millimeters. And let's well, say the excellence never come alone. There's always a lot of things. We tried to find this guy. And we found him. We asked him the questionnaire, and yes, this man had a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. So we had this pacemaker read by the uh, electrons. And indeed, we saw incidents happening in the, in the pattern. Now, it can be because he was climbing the scaffolding, but it can also be because of the magnetic field of the scanner. And to be honest, here is kind of a, a balcony. And on the balcony, there's a little chain with a sign, strong magnetic field, that it pass. So, it was pulled over. But they had to install a couple of things on this wall. So the scaffolding was built. Yeah, that, that's, that's a thing you don't think of beforehand and you cannot take measures against it. But there should be a protocol within the hospital or your institute that if anything is undertaken in the vicinity of your MR room, the first call you. Is it allowed? Do we need to take special measures? 
Okay. Ooh. Yeah. So that is about the uh, department. How to do it. Now we go to part number two. And how safe is your skin? So if I ask you, what, what kind of risk, what do you know about an MR scan? Is it safe, always, not always? What is the main risk, if any, from uh, uh, an MR scan? Ooh. You just check. Mm. What is the first thing you think when you hear MR scan? It's dangerous. Busy researchers. Sorry? Busy researchers. Busy with a lot of stuff, and they just forget that one time to like, take their earrings or their wallet. Okay, and what do you, and they walk inside? Yeah, and they walk inside. Even though they had training, they just have a lot of other things they're doing. And, and you say that's only really important. And then they uh -huh. forgot that one little thing. Okay. So that's often the no incident, but they always make me nervous. Okay. Um, any other thing? Well, you had an example, right? Yes, yes. So, an MRI scanner is potentially dangerous because for the fact that the magnet is always on. Right. <laughs> and that's a simple question, direct answer. This is the most well known danger of an MRI scanner. It's a huge magnet. Um, I'd like to stress this magnetic field is always on 24 7. And it's a mistake to think like. Suppose there's a fire in your department and the fire brigade comes in and they turn off power or you get a power outage. Okay, the lights go out, computers go down, but the magnetic field stays. As long as it's in the superconductive magnet, as long as there's liquid helium in there, the field is on. Whether yes or no, there's a multiple power available. A permanent magnet, well, that's in the name, right? It's permanent. So the field is always. So there is a James Bond movie where he is standing in an MR room and there's a villain with a gun pointing at him and what he does is bang, hit a button on the wall and boom, the gun is drawn from this villain's hand. Total garbage. You cannot just switch on and make the field. Yeah. Complete fiction. So, first of all, it creates translational forces. And please uh, be aware, I'm going to present a lot of information, but the purpose of all this information is that if you are confronted with a patient with an implant that you do not know what it exactly is, or you don't have all the information from the manufacturer, safe or not safe, you have to figure it out for yourself. And then you need to realize all these things. So, translational forces, meaning it pulls on any object, and the object will go in the direction of the scan. And here's an example. Watch these guys. These are two guys clearly working on some, I don't know, woodwork there. And because the technical floor is not closed yet, it's clear, this is a brand new MRI scanner being installed. These two happy fellows are checking. And watch this guy with the drill. He's standing there, he's already closer to the magnet, he turns around. Boom! Gone! <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 The other guy, I just think he goes like this. That's funny. But the message is like, you know, they have been working there for hours now, and it all went well. And clearly, they are not born by the force of the magnet. When you're standing there, it's getting closer, 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 and suddenly, boom, it's gone. You do not get it. Yes or no, suddenly it's gone. Okay, next example. Um, here I am, and what I'm holding here is this ordinary uh, hospital pen. The metal clip I took out because I tried what happens at the pre test line if I leave the clip on? It went in with such violence that it broke. So I skipped that particular demo. So I took the clip off and only the little spring is in there. Now, please observe what happens with the pen if I let it go. 
And you see, look, you see it? It flies in. It almost flies out at the back. That's because it gains an enormous speed. And then it's pulled back. It still passes the center, so it goes back and forth a couple of times. Now with a pen like this, it's not an issue. However, if you do this, that's an oxygen bottle. Ooh, bang, 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 bang. If you go to YouTube and you, and you search for MRI, oxygen bottle, you get this movie. If you crank up the sound, then you get the truth from it. Then you know if a person is lying inside this magnet, no chance. You know, it's end of life. Don't try this at home. <laughs> okay, so another thing I want to tell you is like, if you want to reason how strong a magnet pulls on an object, is it equally strong everywhere? Well, you all can guess like at a larger distance, I feel nothing. If I get closer, it will be more. But it's a bit more complicated. And this graph is to illustrate this, um, just for bearings, this is from a paper, references here, of a four Tesla scanner, but the principle is the same for all our superconductive magnets. This is the center of the board, the ISO center, so in the middle of the magnet. And what you see is that the magnetic field, that is the green line, goes down if you go away from the center. And you see, Hey, it's a four tesla scanner because for a longer stretch inside the board, the field is four tesla, then it goes down, and here we are at the level of the entrance of the board. It is still 1.2 tesla, and away it goes down and down and down. Now the strength of the pool is directly proportionally, uh, proportional with the field strength. So yeah, okay, the closer you get, the stronger the pool. There's another thing. Um, it can be called EBEZ or EBEX, meaning it's the change of magnetic field uh, inside the room. Closer the magnet is higher, a bit away it's lower. So if you were to, if you were able to hear the magnetic field strength, the, the tone of the magnetic field would change if you walk along this room. Now, how fast the change is with one step also determines how strong the field is. And if you look at that particular graph, that is the blue one, you see the enormous bump here, close to the entrance of the board, just inside the board. is a, a very strong peak in that change of magnetic field strength in space. And also the pool is directly proportional to this phenomenon. So if you combine the two, you get the red line. And the red line shows you the strength of pull by this particular magnet. And what you see if you're when you're approaching it at three meters distance from the center, it starts to pull like 50 centimeters inside the board as maximum. And oddly enough, you might not expect it at the center of the magnet. There's no pull whatsoever on the object. It's a bit strange, uh, but you will notice if something flies into the bore of the scanner and it's, it ended up somewhere in the center of the scanner, it's really treacherous because if you grab it, it's very easy to pull it out until you, you come into this area where the pool is maximum. And it's really treacherous. Uh, just imagine one of these uh, perfusion pumps is drawn into your magnet. You stick your head in, you grab it. It's easy to move it. Then you come into this area, and it might well be that the pool becomes so large that it's ripped from your fingers. And what happens? Same as the pen, same as the oxygen bottle. It goes back in and it comes back and you get it in your face. So please be aware that there is a distribution of the pool in that top. Uh, I've talked about that. That's one thing it does. The other thing it does is 
that the magnetic field also induces rotational forces uh, in objects that are made of ferromagnetic material. And just think of this bar magnet, like and you spray some uh, iron particles on it, you get this line pattern. And these we call field lines, but if you take a knife or a pair of scissors made of iron, it will always align with these field lines. And I do have an example of this. So I have a rope just to prevent these scissors to fly into our seven Tesla scanner. And I'm going to flip it and just observe what happens to this particular object. Bang! Suddenly it's gone. In slow motion, it's clear. You have to apply force, you go through the perpendicular of the field lines, and suddenly it goes. And this is the particular reason why I say that if something went into your magnet or is stuck to the surface, don't touch it. Because if you start pulling it away from the magnet, who knows exactly the half of the field lines that come out of the magnet? Only if you know that. You can start to estimate whether it will fit yes or not. You cannot, to be honest. So it might be, and in our hospital, actually it happened, one of these stands to put on a, a container with the infusion liquid was brought too close to the magnet. They thought it was MR safe, it clearly wasn't, and it went smack. And it was stuck to the front of the magnet. Fortunately, because there was a patient in there, took the patient out, and then they made the second error. And with the two of them, they started pulling on this pole. And exactly this happened. It flipped and it went into the board and it was simply folded down. These forces are not to laugh about. It's really dangerous. And luckily, during the flipping of the pole, no one was hit. But if it were the case, there would be serious Injury. So, message is no joke, leave it alone. And this is an experiment that you might do. Um, with the scissors, um, maybe not, but this, <laughs> yes. Um, what I have here is a staircase made of aluminium. Now, aluminium is not attracted by a magnet, however, it's quite nice electrical conductor. And uh, what you see is put on the, on, the, on the table close to the entrance of the magnet and I let go. It feels like nothing happens. Well, actually it's falling. Is what? It is falling. Falling? Yeah. But it's falling so slow you can't even see it. But if you wait a while, you wait a while, and help a bit, I have to pull hard. Now you might appreciate it's fall. It goes really slow. This is a particular uh, phenomenon that helps, uh, what, what uh, happens because of the change of the magnetic field in space. Any electrically conductive material that you move there is basically a conductor exposed to a changing magnetic field. It's exactly the same what happens in an electrical generator. So electrical currents are flowing inside the metal, generating a magnetic field of their own, which is opposed to the magnetic field of the scanner. The faster you try to move it, the stronger the counterforce. It is called the lens effect, L E N Z. You can look it up in Google. This you may want to try. If you have a piece of aluminium, 20 by 20 centimeters or brass or any metal that is non ferromagnetic. If you take it in your hand and you put it in the entrance of the, uh, of the board, closer, also for a permanent magnet, when you move the about, you can feel the forces. It may happen. Why do we demonstrate this? Because a metallic implant inside a patient may, may, in rare situations, also show this same behavior. That's why sometimes if people come and say like, okay, I now have a patient with a tracheostoma, so the tube that goes down the throat, made of silver, they 
can be scanned, but only if this patient is moving really slowly to reduce forces. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Ah, what I need to say though is where the magnetic pool is zero in the center and the maximum at the ends of the pool, this effect of aligning with the field becomes stronger with the magnetic field only. So it's maximum in the center of the core. So it, it really behaves differently. Okay, so if you read up on websites or the information that you get from a manufacturer about can you scan this item? This is the type of words that you may come across the static magnetic field. Also, the spatial gradient. It is not the gradient system in your scanner for uh, localization. It's the change in magnetic field of your current or P0 field, your main magnetic field. And the possible effector, like it may uh, induce a torque. Rotation of force or transmission of force. Okay. Second source: radio waves. In any um, MR scanner, we use a radio transmitter with a large antenna. Here you see a large version, so this guy easily fits in there. This is for the 1.5 and 3 Teslas, but also the similar size in the permanent magnet. The one I'm holding here is the one that we built for uh, the scanner that we are building down the stairs. Uh, it looks a bit, well, really small, but uh, you can easily scan uh, a knee with that particular coin. So there's radio frequency amplifiers in the system. These are the calls to transmit a signal. And it is good to remember that these uh, things are only active during scanning. The magnet is always on 24 7. The amplifier with the radio waves is only active during the scan. So, any interactions with the RF waves are totally irrelevant for the patient that's in there, but not for MR personnel that is working in there, as long as they stay out of the room when the scanner is active. So, that's an important thing to remember. Especially if you have uh, personnel. Uh, our advice for pregnant uh, MR workers is that you, you can work in the MR suite, but you stay out of the room when the scanner is active because of this and the gradient field. So, possible effects are heating, and then I'll refer back to uh, what, was, what was mentioned before about the tattoo. A tattoo getting hot is the interaction between the radio waves and the ink that was used. And the ink can consist of iron oxides. And uh, this well, I was pretty horrid, uh, horrified when I looked it up on Wikipedia. If you look what's inside inks of uh, tattoos, it's like taking your poison. It's that. Well, um, iron oxides are mostly in brown, red, and uh, black ink. Yeah, and if they are electrically conductive, which they are, they might form a circuit. And if you then expose it to radio waves, it might heat up. Now, it is important to keep in mind these are antennas. They are specifically made to be sensitive to a particular frequency. And that you use on your scanner. But if the subject that you are scanning does have a particular implant that is of similar length uh, and it can conduct electricity, then it might act up as an antenna. And to say it bluntly, then you're screwed. Because it's quite a bit of energy that you use in your transfer. Uh, in the form of magnitude of a couple of kilowatts. And if you then have a device somewhere in there that acts as an antenna, it can get hot, really hot. Um, to illustrate this, I will show one particular incident that happened. Oh, before I say that, there is a website, you can Google it, MR wavelength in human tissue. 
and it gives you, you can enter the frequency of your scanner and it gives you the wavelength for, I don't know, 40 or 50 human tissue. And if you take half the wavelength, that's when you are in the worst case scenario. So it can be interesting if you do not know what's exactly inside your patient, but you take an x-ray and you do that in maybe a couple of directions and you can estimate this length. It may be interesting then to check this and see whether it's close to half the wavelength of your scan. Um, yeah, as an example, uh, this is an incident and it's unique. But I only want to illustrate how hot uh, things can uh, become. This was a guy, uh, he had a deep brain stimulator. It's a device that is uh, very, well, say, compare it to a, a cardiac pacemaker. But what it does, um, it has warm electrodes that go up your head, they go in between your two uh, brain hemispheres, and they go into the brainstem, and there's an array of electrodes placed in your brainstem. And it's really amazing because they usually people with uh, patients with Parkinson. You might know that Parkinson people get this, this trap and they can switch this device on and off themselves. And it's really crazy because they are twitching like this and they switch it on and all the channels are really kind of a specialized device. Um, in this particular case this man had a such a device, and he was also a hunter, and it sounds ridiculous, what does it have to do with it? Well, normally they put this electronics up higher up the chest, same location as they put a pacemaker, but he was afraid that the recoil of his hunting rifle hit it, and damaged it. So they put it somewhere down in his bed. And that meant that the electrodes that they used were not standard length, but they were extended. And also during the scanning they made a mistake, they used the wrong transmit coil. And this is a CT image, nothing will be there, but it's just to show the location of um, the electrodes. This person was put in the scanner for a lumbar spine MR. They started scanning, and when they took the patient out, he was paralyzed for the right side of his body. Afterwards, they did an MR again, and you see this part of the brain got so hot because of the radio waves picked up by these electrodes that it was fried. In reverse, this guy was crippled for the rest of his life. The message is, if something works as an antenna, it can become so hot that human tissue can damaged. Now when it's a needle somewhere in a muscle, it's not that bad. You know, it hurts, but it will regenerate. No serious issues. If it's this, it will change someone's life. So the other message is, know what you're doing. And yes, this is a hor horrific story. In our institute, well, it's not a daily basis, but every two weeks we scan someone with a deep brain stimulator or with uh, other electronics to stimulate the bladder or the rectum. There's, there's numerous uh, active movements, as we call them, but you have to know exactly what you're doing and what is allowed. And then I'm thinking MR conditioning. It's on every 16 pages of information you have to go through to get the settings of your scanner correct, uh, but it is doable. Okay, so as a summary, the radio waves um, are transmitted by the, by the body coil. Think of the first picture I showed of the guy with his head stuck in the, in the board, just the magnet, and it's huge. It's about this long, so if you come for a head scan, also the larger part of your chest is also exposed to these radio waves. There's also head-only transmit coils. Is small and only the head is exposed to those radio waves. So, if someone has an implant with a sensitive radio wave that is somewhere in the belly, 
a transmit only head coil or a head only transmit coil, I should say, can be safely used, but not the body coil. Um, specific absorption rate, how much watts do you put in per uh, kilogram tissue per unit? Okay. So these are the parameters you may find in the description of the uh, manufacturer. And yes, possible effects by general warming. Just people are heating up. And local warming. And that might give tissue damage. Please be aware of the general heating. You have to be careful with patients that have fever. Because then the uh, temperature regulation in, inside the body may be disrupted and they maybe cannot handle this additional energy that you pump into them. Okay. The last source of it. Gradient coils. Those are additional coils that generate changing magnetic fields. Top what they look like in, the, in commercial uh, superconductive magnets. Bottom, what they look like when we are building downstairs. Basically, wires find such that you create a coil and you connect it to an amplifier, put a current in there, and you generate a change in the magnetic field. So, they are varying magnetic fields and they are only used during scanning also. You may get this one. People scan on the Philips uh, scanner, I'm probably familiar with this uh, message. PPMS possible peripheral nerve stimulation. And it means that these switching magnetic fields uh, introduce or induce currents that flow through your body, and especially along nerve, uh, what do you call it, nerve tracks. And that may stimulate uh, nerves. And the most common effect is that muscles start to contract. And in the normal settings, it doesn't happen that often, but spinal MR is known for it. Uh, in a research setting, yeah, then they get the most out of the gradients every now and then, and then uh, the chance of this happening. In a way, it's fun when we were scanning uh, one another oh, many, 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 many times. And Quite often. It can be fun in a way, but for patients, it's something else. Okay, then those switching magnetic fields generate a lot of acoustic noise. And here you see an overview of uh, different levels of noise expressed in the decibel. Well, there's a yellow and a red area there, meaning that. Exposure and in the yellow it's continuous, long duration exposure. In the red it's not that long lasting exposure, it may damage your ears. My question to you is like what level of acoustic sound exposure would you expose yourself to for a duration of 30 minutes? If you see this graph. Do you accept 50 dB, 80 dB, 90 dB, 70 dB? What do you feel comfortable about? Where would you put a limit for yourself? Anyone? Yeah? I think between uh, 30 and 40. Between 30 and 40. That's about the level in the, in the library. So you are really safe. <laughs> right? Because you can sit in the library for days. And you just don't get that afraid. Um, just looking where there's someone with earplugs in, because with earplugs in, you play live music, and you usually get to this level. And especially youngsters, they listen to music on a kind of volume with them, they for certain get uh, hearing loss. Here is where it becomes dangerous. Around the 80 dB, exposure for a long time, so people that work in factory, they will get hearing damage if the levels are stretched like between 80 to 90 dB and they don't break their hearing protection. Well, up there, those are the items like a chainsaw or a pneumatic drill. Well, if you stand next to that one, you 
You can imagine your ears can really get damaged. Now, it may surprise you, but the noise inside the scanner can be up to a level of 110 degrees. That's during uh, diffusion weighted imaging or single shot EPIs. Most scanners are at a, at a lower level, but 90 dB is not uncommon. The message here is your patient should be wearing a hearing protection. And I've done this. The, the people that work with uh, MR, do, do you have earplugs that you give out to your subjects? Headphones? Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. Now, be aware that the, the standard headphones of the scanner reduce the level. If you're lucky with something like 10 dB, but not more than that, it's likely that maybe something as low as 6 dB reduction. Um, the earplugs, the, the phone things, if you apply them properly, uh, may reduce it with 25 dB. So if you do have the choice and the possibility of handing out those earplugs, it's a good idea. Now, of course, how long do we scan a subject? Uh, maybe for 20 minutes. But what's the average time for a patient to be in the scanner at your place? 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Yeah. Uh, so you will get away with doing it. You get one out. Yeah. Then it starts to depend on what you're doing. If you do EPIs or diffusion weighted for a full hour, I, I, I would not expect those not multiple sequences. Yeah, and they all make a different noise and a different level. Yes. So it's okay, -ish, but you have to be careful. Excuse me. You had a question. Yeah, I was imagining for those uh, decibels. And, yeah. um, for those kinds that I was talking about, if we adopted, for example, noise cancellation, yeah. 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 yeah, that's that's been proposed many times. Uh, Siemens, one of the major manufacturers, also experimented with it. But as I know, you know, Simon, was it ever put into effect noise cancellation in the MR? Because Siemens tried it. Of the scanner noise. Of the scanner noise. Of the airport? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, my personal experience with this one on the place such is my DDS scan is, is not a big difference between the noise cancelling headphones and the ones that we had. It was my impression too. It is fine, but uh, it's not that much. Which is what we wanted to do. Since we forget actually DPI, we didn't actually see a significant change. Yeah. We didn't so measure that in decibels though, but it's basically subject to this. We didn't measure that in decibels. Is there any benefit? Is there any benefits for what you believe is to. No, you only add noise. So that's, that's the thing, like. Especially in such a loud environment, if you crank up the music, yeah, they don't, if, if you crank up the volume such that you don't hear the skin anymore, you're adding a lot, a lot of uh, extra. I would do it now. No. Unless the FMR is being required to play anything is just nothing. Even if it the signal, actually, it's not very nice. So we have points, basically is the answer. Yeah, still with what does. Yeah. Now we have earplugs mm -hmm. or earphones fixed in. Yeah. So and the sound it's given now is the music which has been whose which volume has been controlled. Yeah. So I was thinking that this time we've reduced the noise, the environmental mm -hmm. noise and then yeah. control was entering it. Yeah, but the, the, the volume you pump in there, that comes from the integral for the audio system, and also has to go through these earplugs, right? So, and we assume that what we're putting has cut off the environmental sound from the Yeah, but no, that's not the case. They're just adding a different kind of noise. Be careful. Okay, then. 
So again, this is an overview. In information that you get from manufacturers, there might be remarks about the maximum slew rate, that is how fast this gradient system is, cranks up from zero to its maximum value that is used. Um, and you can set it on your scanner. There are options to say like, okay, I don't want a slew rate higher than say, 200 tesla per second. The effects that we encounter is a possible uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. When people have active implants with electronics, with those fields you can also uh, trigger those devices, like a pacemaker or a nerve stimulator, generate uh, action in the device, and it gives vibrations. If you put your hand on the scanner, you, you feel the vibrations of these gradients uh, switching. Can be really uh, nasty for the patients. Yeah, and then the, the most difficult one. So we talked about the environment of your scanner, of the scanner itself. And then how safe is your patient actually? And that is a real nightmare to find out. So I'd like to stress whether you can scan something safely is a joint uh, effort because you need to get as much information as you can. And that's easier said than done. But sometimes if you phone up the surgeon that did the uh, operation, for example, or you know what's in there because you saw the operation report, uh, you can look it up on the website of the manufacturer uh, and, and, and gather information. But the world is not perfect. Um, for the radiology department, it's to gather all this information and put a label to it, either unsafe, or safe, or conditional. And if it's conditional, you have to state what conditions need to be met to scan safely. And that might prove pretty difficult. So, what do you need? Well, you, you need to know basically what's in there, what it's made of, uh, and how it got there. Because if you are confronted with a patient that doesn't know what's in there, from the history you might deduce possible options. Was it during uh, an armed conflict? Was it a car crash? Was it an operation? What was the purpose of the operation? When was it performed? Also important, in what year was the operation performed? MRI started about, clinical MRI started about in the early 1980s. At that particular time, there was no manufacturer of any implant that thought like, okay, let's make it safe in a magnetic environment, because it didn't exist yet. And as an example, vascular clips they put on the arteries in your brain, uh, around the mid 80s, they produced clips made of stainless steel that were quite ferromagnetic. Uh, there's one single report of a person dying because of that. Because they put this person in the scanner and the clip aligned with the magnetic field, ruptured the artery, and the patient died. There's also a report of someone with a similar clip that was scanned and nothing happened. But the message is, like, depending on the year that implants were put inside the subject, it helps you to estimate how big the chances are of interaction with the magnetic field of the radio Because the more recent the implant is, the larger the chance that the manufacturer took this into consideration when designing the implant. Um, yeah, of course you can uh, screen the internet for, for things. You can also try and find post-operational uh, uh, imaging, like x-rays or CTs might be really helpful or other MRI scans. Um, but in the end, you need to estimate like based on what materials in there, what's the size, what's the shape. And that's why I came with all this information about interaction with the magnetic field and the radio frequency waves. Because then you need to kind of estimate for X-rays, for example, is the metal that's not that's easy to recognize. But what is the shape? Is it a sphere? And this rotational force will not occur. Is it a very elongated shape? 
like thin and long, then the rotational force would be maximum. Where in the body is it? How does that relate to the distribution of field length inside your scanner? So a lot of things you have to take into account, and so the information I just gave you. And in the end you have to decide, am I going to decide uh, the scan this patient? And it might be that the decision is, I don't trust it, let's do a CT if that's available. Or you go like, yeah, if we don't scan or we don't get this information, then the patient might die. So yes, we scan, we take the risk. It's uh, kind of bad. Okay, so let's skip this one. Ah, as an example, would you scan this? It's an intraocular lens. So for people with glaucoma, they take out the lens and instead they put this in. It's tiny, as you can see when it's on a fingertip. Plastic. <laughs> ah, the question about what material? It's made of PMA, perspex, a kind of plastic. Would you scan it? So how does it work? You go like, okay, this is one single material. It's plastic. Is a magnet able to pull on something made of plastic? No. Okay. You can skip that. Does radio waves interact with plastic? No. Only with electrically conductive materials. Plastic is an insulator. No interaction. The gradient fields, the switching fields, do they interact with something made of plastic? No. Then all your sources of risks are covered. No risk, you can scan this safely. It becomes a bit more tricky if we start talking uh, about this. This is also advanced. Are you familiar with cochlear implants? Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. That's something special. Because the cochlear implants, yeah, okay, an electronic device. Uh, at the top, the little round thing, there, that's, that's mostly the curve. But what they do, they plant it in a, in a cavity, they make a cavity in the skull. This device is in that cavity, and these leads go into your inner ear, into the cochlea, and these are arrays of electrodes that are in the cochlea. And what does it do? On the outside of the head, you click an outside unit with a microphone in there. It receives the audio, it changes it into an electronic signal that is picked up by this unit. This is a loop. And it generates electrical fields on those electrodes. And for the patient, that is uh, making sound to the patient. The thing is that this little round thing there is a magnet. The external unit you click onto this device by means of the magnet. Uh, you can imagine if you have a magnet in your device and you put that inside a scanner with a huge magnet, there might be interaction, but there will be interaction. Highly complicated in the sense like manufacturers are improving all the time on the type of magnet, and about a year and a half back. One of those uh, manufacturers created a magnet that was really smart. Um, I tried it out, putting it on my head, holding it with my hand, went into the three Tesla scanner, nothing happened. So that's the extreme. There are the early models you cannot put into a magnet. It's dangerous to put a subject with a very old kind of pocket in the inside an MR scanner. With the latest models, some of them, you don't even need to wrap a bandage around the head, you can just move them in the free Tesla scanner, and it's okay. So here, yeah, with these devices, you get a lot of information, but you have to read really carefully. Because if you compare the information for Canada with the information for the same device, or the same manufacturer for the Netherlands, it's different. So it's worth, if you look on the internet, and you get a hit, and you get your information, keep on looking. And if you see two different uh, information sets, 
a different value for much of the child, for example. Use your senses and reasoning whether it's acceptable to take the highest level. And if it's allowed in one country, it's allowed in your country also. It's a legal thing. But you have to think it over, you have to discuss in case there's an incident with this patient. You need to be able to prove that you really thought about this. Yeah. For the cochlear implant, what is noting the signals you are getting from the implant directly to the brain or it's passion connected with the ear? No, the thing is that like, these electrons go all the way deep into your cochlea. And what they do is around the tip there are seven or I mean 13 electrodes and between these electrodes they create an electrical field and that electrical field directly stimulates the, uh, the nerves, the nerve ends that normally register shape. So it's, they really generate electrical fields to stimulate nerves. Okay. That's a, it's a, a very clever device. Okay. Taking too much of your time, I think. This is this is yet another warning. It's about another hearing implant. And what I just want to point out that if you look things up, you must be really careful because this is called the vibrant sound bridge vibrating fascicular prosthesis, the 4503. It's MR compatible. Well, conditional it should be. In certain conditions, yes, you can spin it. This is the fiber sound bridge vibrating fascicular prosthesis for 502X. It's not allowed inside the MR. So if you do have the information like, okay, this patient has a vibrant sun bridge, <laughs> can you scan it? You don't know. If it's a 4, you don't know. If it's a 4, 5, 0, you don't know. You need to know whether it's a 503 or a 506. And it goes for many, many, many implants. You have to have the exact information. And that's what it looks like. So then there's another thing. So this is a, a patient with a cochlear implant. Um, and you see in the standard scan, there's quite a gap there. And that's because we use a magnetic field to make images. When you put a magnet in there, it's good. And this is a very modest artifact. In most cochlear implant scans, half the brain is totally gone. Well, you can optimize your scans. And it's not like you push a button like Nice scan, but the modern scanners have sometimes the option of uh, artifact reduction scan, and they change the kind of radio frequency process, for example, and it's uh, less sensitive to the uh, to the homogeneity. Okay, now this might be of great help um, if you're not familiar with this particular website. Please take it. This, personally, I think, is the greatest MR website there is if you want to have information about anything about MR. Really. And there are so many websites that <laughs> it's good to see Sorry, you the right I go There's many websites, but this one is like, on one hand, the language they use is easy to understand, and on the other side, if you look from the physics, uh, perspective, they are always correct, and that's a unique combination. It's understandable and it's correct. It's a great, great website, and maybe you can read it here. But it's, it's about difference in magnets, but it can also be about safety or contrast agents or the entire scala of things you want to know about is on this website. And right questions. That's one. Then there's this one. Any of you that know this one? MRISafety.com. Okay, it's an American website. If you know what implant is in your patient, go to this website and what they have is a page they call the list. Alright, the list. And it is what it is. You just punch in if, if you're do a broad search, you go with my hip, 
or orthopedics, you get hundreds of items. Um, but if you are more specific, like the 4502X, there's a high chance you get a hit. And there you can read that there's different categories that go like MR safe or MR unsafe or conditional, as I have conditional 1 through 8. Um, well, if you know exactly what's in there and you go to this site, there's a fair chance to find it. And then you have all the information. And if you want to play, like practice a bit, like okay, I suppose you have a patient with this or that. This is, um, well, you can see from the name, it's LUMC, it is on GitHub. Uh, a colleague uh, and I put this one together. It's 10 different cases of uh, uh, implants and patients. And you can play a bit, and what we do is we present the case uh, with a question like, okay, what would you do? And you can give your advice, and I'll punch it in, but just in your head. And then you get a bit more information or links are in there and finally we give our conclusion of uh, how we decide to uh, yes or no. Okay, then last but not least, uh, how about the low field work? Because yeah, I'm here and I'm totally grateful uh, that I was uh, invited by uh, uh, Jonas to uh, help build a uh, low field schema downstairs. This is a magnet. As we speak, they are building the last of the three uh, radiant pieces. Um, yeah, basically in the basement, an MR scanner is being built. But the field strength, point two or three of us, point three, point three Tesla, one point five Tesla, three Tesla. This one is fifteen million Tesla, so zero point zero five Tesla. So really a weak uh, map. There's disadvantages, and this is the major disadvantage. It's such a weak mecca. Your signal to noise really plummets. It's really low. Well, this is a bit of a rough estimate, but it's you know, if you are scanning and you get a noisy image on your 1.5 Tesla scanner, you may want to change something in your efficient time or the type of coin you use, and if you have a gain of 50%. Signal to noise, you go, yeah, so we're doing good here, right? I'm not talking about 20%, I'm not talking about 50%, or well, the SNR is like less than a percent of what you guys are used to. So that's, a, that's really an issue. Another thing is, like, yeah, hey, it's, it's such a small device, um, you're not going to build a specially designed room for it because all your scans are inside the room and it's completely covered in probably copper for before they put the magnet in to shield this room from any radio waves that come in. Not with this one, and you don't put it in a, in a room. So there is we need additional measures to keep all the radio waves that you don't want out of the system. And then, because it's such a tiny magnet, I mean, it's not that the person that you put in there has a tiny, tiny head. The head stays equally large, but the scanner the magnet is much smaller. And that uh, poses uh, a special challenge to get your field homogeneity uh, on the level that you want. So these are the disadvantages, but there are quite a number of advantages. Because in general, an MR scanner, I'm not sure about the, the permanent magnet scanners, but roughly an MR scanner goes like a million per Tesla to, to get it on your side. Yeah, that's a lot of money, yeah? Um, we think this, this, this build, what we do downstairs, well, basically, we ship a complete crate with all the parts, and we think it was the tools, that was something like $28,000. It's really something different than one million, right? Of course, we don't calculate the cost for development and such or the time it takes to build it, but it's a different magnitude. So, for especially lower middle income countries, we hope this is a way of bringing the power of MR imaging, uh, because if you don't have money, you don't have an MR. 
uh, or the availability is really low, and maybe if we make it cheaper, um, it's, it becomes more available, or easier. Then another thing is magnetic susceptibility. How sensitive are you for the magnetic properties of the tissue you put in? Well, with this low field strength, hard. The lungs or the sinuses in your head contain air. On a 1.5, you already see it. On a 3 Tesla, it's even worse. On a 7 Tesla, it's really a problem. It disturbs the magnetic field and therefore it disturbs your life in its quality. On this low field strength, hardly any influence. And also, if you have implants, the artifact, the size of the artifact is really, really much longer. I will show you uh, an example in a minute. Then also SAR, so the specific absorption rate, how much energy do you deposit in your subject during scanning? A rough estimate again, about a factor of times it lower. So basically, yeah, it depends a bit on the design of your antennas. But it should be, we expect it to be a non issue. And therefore, because of the weak magnet and really low SAR, contraindications for MR really drop. So we expect that you can be much less stringent. On implants. You know, a normal scanner, already if you have a three Tesla scanner when you are at the entrance of the board, it's still one Tesla. This scanner, 50 milli Tesla, when you're at the distance of the board, is this far, about 20 centimeters off. You're below the limit of any risk for the magnetic field, caused by the magnetic field. So if you have someone with a metal implant in the hip, it's not relevant if you scan the head in the scanner because it's already far enough. And then the noise, yeah. uh, we see it as an advantage. The noise levels are much lower. If we take our gradient system to the max, it's about 65 degrees. That's the, the sound level. It's, it's even less than the sound level we have here when I'm talking in this room, right? More or less the same. Level. And then, from an MRI perspective, your T1 and T2 and T2 start change in a way that you can also use it to either shorten your scanning time or make your scans more sensitive. Um, which also means that the contrast changes. And that's what we see in the, the contrast between white and grey matter in the brain changes. And that's a learning process. You still have to see whether that's more difficult easier if that it just gives you different information from different scans. As a comparison, a study that we did with the low field scanner, it's the, the highlighted columns, it's the force of different objects. We dangle it from a, from a rope like here and we measure the force on the item. And if you see here like an iliac stand or uh, endoscopic clip, or a glucose sensor. It's a, a little electronic device you can stick on your arm. There's a small needle going into the skin, and people with diabetes can uh, constantly monitor their sugar level. If you look at the forces, that on the 7 Tesla, especially the glucose sensor, there's already a force of uh, 140 millinewtons. Million on the 50 uh, Limited as well as only eight. If this of no interest, it doesn't do anything. And lastly, if you look at these uh, different implants, like a separate occluder or a stent, well, this is a pedicle screw that you screw into the spine uh, to straighten it, for example. And, and it's got a clip. You see different field strength. And look at the size of the artifact. And it grows and it grows and it grows. And in all items, although the first three items you see on the 50 minute test on scanner, such a screw you can simply recognize. It is an artifact in the sense that you don't get signal from the thing itself, but you can recognize the shape. It's a 
practice track is not much larger than the screw itself. Whereas on a 3 or 7 Tesla scanner, it's huge. And of course, people that have such implants in their spine quite often come for a spine examination on their MRI. And if the artifact is this large, you cannot touch the spine anymore. So we are also hoping to kind of build a larger version of the present one. For example, to scan the lungs of the spine. Well, that's basically uh, what I had to tell you, and I hope you see it on the Okay, um, good afternoon. Just before lunch, I think um, I'll make my talk as um, brief as possible so that um, we can go for lunch and then go for a practical session and then come back and have some more talk and then we go and prepare for our dinner. The dinner promises to be very exciting and I'm sure most of us will enjoy uh, it. So this afternoon I'll be talking about looking uh, MRI and uh, maybe its contribution to improve global access to neural imaging. I'm not sure it's quite just the point. Okay, so um so we have been at least at the Sub-Saharan uh at least it has been an interesting session uh you know so far and I'm particularly excited about this image because it shows us to be more relaxed, you know, and uh, those of you who have visited the Google form or Google uh, Drive, you have seen a lot of more interesting images. I'm so excited by the dynamism of all the participants. I'm sure if you look closely, you can find yourself. Sarah, I know we can't find you in this photograph. Uh -huh. No, but, it's okay. I just thought it's something you're wearing. It's so, nice. Yeah. So, this is kind of, so I'm telling you about uh, just giving MRI, global access to MRI, which I think has been you know, widely discussed. I'll, talk, I'll also talk about the challenges of MRI and the possible solutions. And I'll give you a brief idea about my own work in MRI research and then the recipe for me. Now, with MRI, the imaging technique allows us to see what is invisible. You know? And the beautiful thing about MRI is that the higher you go, the more you can see in terms of field strength. And I'm sure you can see in those days more when you need to look for what? Network. About how it's about, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, you can see this young man had to find people in an electric pole just looking for network, you know? <coughs> so with MRI, the higher you go, you know, the more you can see. And we were in a discussion a couple of days ago about the, how much relevant to 11 Tesla or 11 point seven Tesla be. It may not be relevant for every institution and everywhere, but you have it in its relevance. But with, with that amount of strength, you're able to see more. But what we know is that with the basic system, you'll be able to see, you'll be able to help more people. MRI. Current MRI that we're using started with the watch with a very low field, as low as 0 0.05 Tesla. And this over 40 years of MRI technology has grown. And now we're talking about 11.7 Tesla. But the low field MRI, the sub Tesla MRI, is still relevant for those of us in the low and middle income countries. Because we, may, we still need it for basic understanding basic diagnosis to be able to know how what is happening in the brain. And with improved technology in terms of AI technology, in terms of you know using machine learning and other building sequences, we know that the initial quality of MRI that was put 40 years ago is not the same low field MRI we are seeing today. Because we can enhance the quality of the images and do more with even low field MRI. Now, MRI in healthcare has a significant amount of benefits. 
and it has actually transformed you know, the healthcare system in developed countries. I'm not sure it has done that significantly in low and middle income countries because what you find in low and middle income countries is that it's only maybe the top 1% are the only ones that have access. You know, significant access and actually make use of the technology. MRI, in terms of you know, impact, in terms of the technology, it has also been so impactful that it has attracted seven Nobel Prizes. And, you know, it's painful that even though it is, it is transforming the healthcare in developed countries, about 90% of the world still have zero access. And this disparity is not something that I think that, I, that I'm not encouraging, but it's something that I think that, you know, a low-fit MRI can answer. And if you look at these are the Nobel Prize winners and all that. So we've talked about so much about the distribution of MRI in the last uh, couple of days, and which we also know, like I said, Africa especially is the worst hit in terms of the distribution. And like even in our Ghanaian speaker said, in, in, in terms of Ghana, in terms of the population, it is 0.6 per million population, you know, have access to MRI. Globally, 90% of the world do not have access. You understand? And it gets worse in Africa because 50% of Africans, you know, don't even have any zero, zero access to MRI. Like I said, 80% actually, that's the, that's the figure. Now, what was fine is that if you correlate, you know, life expectancy, high the income ratio, the amount of internet use, and even the economic grouping, you find that, that if there's a correlation with access to MRI. And that means that there is some form of those who have, if you have better, if you have MRI, you definitely most likely have a better healthcare system. If you have a better healthcare system, most likely you're going to have a greater, you know, uh, what you call life expectancy. And this is what has been seen in Japan. I think Japan has the largest amount of greater, greatest access to MRI more than any other country. And of course, they have the highest uh, life expectancy. And then the cost of, cost of MRI is an expensive machine. It's an expensive machine to acquire, an expensive machine to maintain. So those higher income countries have better access. You understand? And MRI also requires some amount of technology, some amount of stability, electricity, and all that. And that's why we see that if people who have no access to internet, no access to electricity, also will have no access to MRI. So it is not something that we can change overnight. If your economic level is low, you will definitely have no access to basic, normal, um, what do you call it, MRI technology, because you cannot afford it. And that is why things like low field MRI are coming in place to be able to change the norm, to make MRI what's cheaper, make MRI portable, make MRI more accessible to the general population. But there are challenges, even to this low field MRI. You know, when we talk about low field, of course, like I said, there's an argument for us in Africa, Anything that is less than one Tesla, we consider it as low field. You understand? The challenges of MRI in Africa, the most of the low income countries, is they are is it, is that they are expensive, and that the MRIs that we do have in Africa, they are what mostly they are very obsolete. You understand? Right? For, for clinical use, they are obsolete and all that, and we do not have even the capacity to be able to supply the power that we need to maintain these systems. And of course. Storage is also a, 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 a challenge. Storage of the systems, having access to uh, data to be able to do research and all that. Those are the limitations. In terms of maintenance, you know, perhaps, like somebody was saying, the research engineers or the market, our American engineers that need to work on these tools, they are very few. They are poorly trained. They don't know how to do the tools to be able to do all, all these things. And even for the people that supply these machines, when they give you the machine, even at a, a relatively affordable rate, you have very expensive service contracts. If anything gets important, you pay a huge amount you know, to, make, to be able to bring the machine back to life. And so these are the things and the challenges that we face in you know, our region, like Africa and all that. So, in terms of personnel also, there's also a big challenge. There's also a huge challenge. You find that, that most of the people that manage MRI or use MRI in our environment are what? Are poorly trained. Poorly trained in the sense that they 
I do not have the tools to be able to uh, work, but, you know, uh, work with or do any, any other of these things. These are some slides I want to show you. I don't know if it's in the market. So, so basically, and then you have very few structured areas where you can have training or have exposure in our community. I've shown this slide previously that showed the distribution of energy. And it was also part of my talk where I showed that if you have good access to electricity, your, your output is what is most likely to be better. And then you see, you look here, you know, that the, the areas where you have what? Better electricity. You can see a correlation. The output is better. You see South Africa there, yeah, in terms of the neuro, neuroscience output that they're putting out, is more than even more other parts. The other country that you see is Egypt. You know? So these are the kind of things. This is over 20 years of research. And when you're doing MRI, MRI in Africa, most of it is used for what? You know, neuroscience. Mostly neuroscience, like neuroscience and this is MRI. Other parts of the body, you can actually make do with other imaging modalities like CT, ultrasound, and all that. So for neuroscience, you need, for it to do good research or give good clinical output, you need an MRI. Okay? There are certain misconceptions, you know, over the years. You know? And this is in the sense that most people that sell machines actually are not, these days, they're not longer interested in low field MRI. Because generally, people feel that, look, why do I want to buy something old? Oh, low field MRI is, is something of the future, it's something of the past. Let's move to the future. This is the new age. Everybody's changing like iPhone from iPhone 1 to iPhone 10 to iPhone 11 to iPhone 13. If you put an iPhone 1 now, nobody wants to buy it. You understand? But the fact that what you need the phone for, an iPhone 1 can do basically every other thing that you really you need for basic phone technology. But everybody, even amongst us here, you find that everybody wants to buy, you know, you want to buy the latest iPhone, even though you are going to use less than 10% of the functions. And that's what's happening even in the medical world. Most hospitals, big hospitals, they want to buy a T-Tesla machine, even though they're not going to use 10% of the function of the capability of that machine. And that's the problem of Africa. You know, we go for the, you know, the high end thing. That machine is generally, you can use the amount you buy in three Tesla or seven Tesla, you can buy maybe 50 or 100 no field MRI systems that you can distribute to the population. So that's one of the challenges. Even scientists, researchers, researchers will encourage group of funding to go to buy high end systems. These are the challenges we have. And we must begin to you know, take back. And some of the misconceptions is that when you have a low field MRI, it automatically translates to poor quality image. You understand? You know, no field MRI means that the amount of signal you generate is what? It's low. The field is low, and the amount of imaging you can do all this. But this does know that even with no signal, you can use certain tools to enhance the quality and produce images that are clinically, diagnostically relevant and useful to be able to change the clinical outcomes of patients. So this is where we need to, to, to change our thinking. Because if you look here, this is the low, this is the 1.5 Tesla MRI in 1986 compared to what it looks like now. But if you look again, you will see here, this here is a what? Is a 0 0.3 Tesla MRI. In 2019, you can say it compares almost closely with the 1.5 Tesla MRI in 1980 in, in 2009. So, the image technology is improving. So, with no field and with no field, right? With no field, I get about 0 0.6 Tesla, that's what we use in my, in, my, in my hospital. So, if you look, there's a little difference in terms of imaging quality, in terms of diagnostic relevance. So, no field MRI still has a place. To play. In terms of other things, you find that no field MRI that we're talking gives you what? You are able to be cheaper, it's more affordable compared to the high end systems. The operational cost is less. You, in terms of the fringe field, in terms of you know, damage, you're talking about, talking about image, uh, image safety, you have lower risk with no field MRI. And you can have people MRI with low field, such that you can be able to do what? Intervention. You are able to do some cases. Even in some cases, the tissue contrast is even better at lower field. These are the things. Like, you know, like we have seen also the artifacts you get, just like getting water, you show it. 
You can see with those temporal hair, the artifacts you can get in image that can, that, that can distort your image for diagnostic quality is lower. So there are some significant advantages with no field MRI. Let me just skip this in terms of process. You understand? High profile is one of the companies that is, you know, has invested so much in no field MRI. And their own case is not even low field, they're talking about ultra low field systems. And they've been able to achieve you know, a strength that is about 0 0.064, which is a good strength. The only problem is at a cost, with, with, with the local system that they have, if you don't have any set cost, you know, there's no shaking, there's no noise, and all that. And even the, the, the SAR, you know, like we also say, also, it's like one tenth. So there's little damage or heating that happens with the body. And it can be right now what they have also told us, and it is a system that's what available for point of care. You know, that you can actually use it in the emergency department or take it to the bedside and use. And it's able to produce, you know, relatively good uh, sequences, T1, T2, flare, and DWI, which is very relevant in stroke and even also in acute uh, uh, trauma. One of the downsides that I consider as a downside is that it is highly commercial. You know, it's still, it's relatively still expensive for uh, the middle and lower income countries because it's, it costs you the same amount. But the foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is sponsoring some of the work that has been done in Africa, in Malawi, and also in Pakistan, you know, that is being done. And we are hoping that, you know, Hyperfire will be able to reduce its cost and make it even more available. And this has to be something that is across from the internet, the quality of the images that get into the Hyperfire systems. And what we are building here in Uganda, as I'm told, the hallback, the hallback system can produce images that, you know, are comparable or even better than what the hyperfine system is currently giving. The hyperfine system is one of the only systems, I think, one of the ultra low fee systems that they want, that is uh, FDA approved for clinical use. And what we are doing here in Uganda is we are able to generate a signal, help you know, build, uh, manipulate the sequences and get good quality images. It would be able to even challenge even that uh, field where Hyperfan is dominating and getting even cheaper systems to greater number of people. So I'm sure you can recognize that is uh, Jones there, and uh, this is the Hyperfan system they have in the Mali. You know, and, 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 and I've been told it's a heavy system, it's not as portable as you know it's been made well, to believe. But we hope that we can create systems that are even more portable, that you can actually move around easily to communities and able to do new imaging. You know, and solve most of the challenging problems in those environments. And this is the hyperfine system as you know, advertised on the net. You can the net as you see there. And this is, you know, they've developed all the beauty about it. And I'm sure that we go with time, you know, the systems will become more robust, the systems will become more reproducible, the technology will become more available, and then of course the price will go down. And almost everybody will be able to if they have a clinical problem with their neurological system within Africa, can be able to afford to get some level of imaging of their brain and get some improvement in the uh, quality of life and outcome, outcomes. So, there are several benefits. Um, these are things that most clinicians we can talk about. Okay? So, I just want to just talk about some of the developing countries you know, that most of the MRI are only available towards the rich. It's not as if MRI is not available in Africa. And as we have shown this morning, it is only mostly available to the upper middle class and the world, the upper class. And that is what we want to change. The rich, you know, should not be the ones that are living or should the ones benefiting from healthcare. Africa do not have a robust or universal healthcare system that provides insurance for everybody. And most of the low income countries have the challenge we have. So if you can have a machine or a system that can be what, you know, affordable even for the poor, you know, to make a, 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 a great change. So the idea is to be able to have a low field that is what, that is sufficiently available, you know, for diagnosis, that is low resource settings, and can address the problems of the people who are neglected, who are the underserved, and under, under, underrepresented in global economics of health. So, there are several innovations that have come up, 
and uh, the people that are leading it are mostly, you know, with the work of uh, Jones, you know, has helped us to be able to bring some innovations on Andrew Webb as well. These are people who are contributing to bring these innovations to make NRI more what? More portable, more uh, or cheaper, and accessible to the generality of the, uh, of the, of the population. And uh, I, I feel very, actually, very, very uh, excited that bringing all this technology together, even here in Uganda, you know, and working with Africans, we are able to, to see a, a light at the end of the tunnel, whereby we can begin to learn the technology ourselves and make this technology available to a greater number of people. Okay, so just uh, in rounding up, just to tell you that for the past 15 years, and this is our hospital, okay, we got, uh, and it's about, we have about over, I think about a thousand beds, and it's one of the centers of excellence in Africa, and we've had a low field MRI since 2005. And that's what we have been using it to do our research, to do our clinical work for the past, you know, um, you know, more than close to 20 years now. The only challenge, like I said, are the challenges of electricity, challenges of uh, having access to competent engineers, because our downtimes are extremely long. Right now, the hospital has two MRIs, two low field MRIs, and none of them are working because, you know, because we do not have the appropriate for our medical engineers to handle them. We do not have, you know, uh, the appropriate you know, equipment or the appropriate service parts that are not available. And this is people are losing, you know, there's loss of money, there's loss of, you know, quality care because this technology is not available. And this is what people have worked with over the years. Most of, most of my work has been what in stroke, dementia, and epilepsy. And uh, even using this low field system, basically, you know, our work has been on CT and low field MRI. And within a span of about you know, 10 years, we've, we've been able to work with experts across three continents, you know, and uh, right now we have about 15 sites in Africa. And we've been able to publish more than at least more than 100 publications, creating our own little impact, with our own low field systems and all that. So if you can get access, you know, to a, a couple of high field systems, it's not necessarily the high field systems that make the impact. It's what the people need. The innovation you know, what you're able to do with the tools you have to make a greater change in your local environment. Okay? So even low field systems, the areas of epilepsy where you need high end, you know high field or high resolution systems. We are doing some work with UCL, where we are able to see if there is a way we can enhance our low field system to approach that to 1.5 or even a 3 Tesla, so that we can use low field images, you know, using machine learning tools, and be able to make or see, image or, or see lesions clearer with machine learning, and be able to make more diagnosis and give, you know, more uh, clinical impact in epilepsy in places like low field because they don't have access to you know high end or uh, greater economic power to purchase these high end machines. Okay? So for Africa, um, I use this slide for one presentation. For Africa, what we need to do is that we need to embrace what? Technology. Okay? We need to be able to expose ourselves to current modern technology. And we have to learn what to innovate to address the challenges we have and then enhance our capacity our educational capacity, our engineering capacity to compete with the rest of the world or to be able to attract technology from the rest of the world and we must learn to what? Build our own system. We must learn to what? Not be just taking from the rest of the world all the time. We must learn to build our own systems and to do that, that is the only thing that can work that is be sustainable. Right? You build your own system, you'll be able to what? Maintain it, you'll be able to improve on it, you'll be able to address or modify it to address the Problems that are particularly pertinent to your environment. So that's what I'm calling us to do: to learn from the world and address, use that technology to address local uh, local problems. So low field MRI has enormous relevance in our own clinical setting in low and middle income countries, and it is targeted it's what? to address the problems of underrepresented and underserved populations. It has it has significant potential to change the technology of the world. It also has potential to make MRI more available to the 
two seasons, unlike let's say in the Europe where you have winter, summer, what? Spring. Spring. Here we have dry season and wet season. And currently are we in which season are we in? Rain. Yeah, kinda of rain season, but yeah. And in the northern Uganda, northern Uganda, there are there is it's really hot that side. It's really hot. And they experience some desert like conditions, especially in areas such as Karamoja, that side in the north. So when we, when when you come back, at least move around and yeah, you see very beautiful things that side. Uh the flag. What is the flag? Maybe talking about this flag, we have a very beautiful creature in the middle. This beautiful creature is called the crested crane. When you look at the crested crane, it has very many colors. Very many colors signifying that Uganda is a very beautiful nation. Uh, and when you look at it, it's, it's one leg. One leg is moving forward. It's showing that Uganda never keeps going backwards. We are always moving forward. Africa. We are moving forward. Yes, and when you look at this, this flag, it has six bands of colors, but they keep on repeating themselves. Black, yellow, red, black, yellow, red. The black signifies that we are Africans, we are black. Africans, we are black, and we are very proud of it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, they are, oh, they are, we have some other Africans who are not black. <laughs> For example, Dr. Stefan. <laughs> yeah. Then we have yellow. Yellow represents sunshine. Sunshine. Yeah, very beautiful. Yellow is a very beautiful color, sunshine. Then red, we all have red blood. Yeah. Despite the fact that you are light skinned, just like Dr. Stefan, whether you are black or white, blood is always red. So that's the significance of this red. Yeah, and brotherhood. Actually, that signifies that we are brothers and sisters. Despite the color, despite everything, we are brothers and sisters. Maybe let me invite my colleague to continue from there. Yes, uh, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, for our international friends, you're most welcome to Uganda. I'm just going to talk something small about the history of Uganda and some few facts about Uganda. I'm called Boa Isaac, he's my colleague and other friends. We are so proud about Uganda and we are welcoming you all. So, our population so far is estimated to be around 45 million people, but uh, the country is, well, is much populated in town areas. If you go in Kampala, those of you who came and uh, saw you move that night and people were sleeping. If you move during the day, you find a lot of jam along the way in Kampala. As well, if you witness within the city here in Mara, it's the same case. So the language is spoken mostly is English and Swahili. Because we have so many, so many tribes. We have about 52 tribes here. That means we have about 52 different languages in Uganda. That's why he was trying to point the way people in Uganda greet and he was paying because it's used to have people in uh, the other side. Of it. I personally come from northern Uganda, that is uh, Lira, and our language. We also preach different. The way we greet is Tianimo. Yeah. If I say it you say yeah. yeah. So that is all I mean. Yeah, so uh, religion, uh, we have uh, mainly populated with uh, Christian religion and Muslim constitute about 12% and others about 3%, including also those who don't pray. Yeah. <laughs> so in Ghana the Republic, we got our independence in 1962. And uh, we are just going to celebrate uh, 60 years of independence. Uh, yeah, so our economy, mainly we have so many resources uh, when we look in Uganda here. Yeah. Uh, currently, we are now going to start mining uh, our oil. We 
we have a lot of oil around Lake, Lake Albert down there. And uh, those who have been following the recent history, we have also a fight with the, yeah, with the, the European Parliament trying to stop us from mining our oil. But we have so many other, we have copper, we also have hydropower, uh, because we have so many lakes and uh, the reef valley, mostly that's where we tap our hydropower from. We have nitrogen, we have salt, we have phosphate, we have oil, which I've already talked about. And agricultural wise, we have coffee, we grow coffee, though most of them are for export. Uh, we have tea, we have cotton, tobacco, potatoes, bananas. Ah, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Then we have uh, uh, those fisheries, we have beef, what needs is always there. We shall see all this if we have, uh, during our dinner time. We shall have to taste them. Uh, the fish that we normally eat here commonly is the Nile Patch and the Tilapia. These are the fish that we got from our lakes, those freshwater lakes there. And uh, we have so many processing industries coming up. We also have cement industry, the E. So, uh, Uganda got to know to the Europeans about the mid 19th century there, and uh, the person who welcomed the Europeans was uh, King Mutesa, the first, who was in Uganda region. So, he's the one who welcomed those people in Uganda, and uh, they stayed with us after around 1962, when now we say bye bye to them. That's why we celebrate our independence up to now. Yeah, so uh, you can also have uh, very many varieties and species of animals. Uh, you can see we have the elephants, we have also the pythons are there, we have the mountain gorillas. Those who haven't seen them, you can visit some of the game parks <laughs> and yeah, sure you have a look at all these animals there. There are so many, quite a big number of them, animals. So I think if we get time, next time instead of coming for MRI, you can plan to come just for tourism. <laughs> yes, I mean, to a Uganda. And uh, mostly, uh, we have a lot of pineapples. Yeah. Yes. Pineapples and banana. Yeah, pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> Mashed bananas, boiled banana, fried banana. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we have a lot of pineapples. We have a lot of and we even have juice. We have juice for banana. We have juice for yes, Rolex. Yeah. So uh, and that's all about Uganda. The little that you can get to know about so when you go outside. Uh, make sure you talk about Uganda, the beauty that you have seen, and you're welcome and your colleagues to also come. Thank you. Is that? Uh, yeah. actually here to clap. The other day today was a cultural day. And, uh, the reason that's why you see uh, most of us not putting us, putting on cultural wear, we decided to buy flags. It's just because in Uganda we have different cultures. And, <laughs> unlike Nigeria, I think everyone in Nigeria dresses like no, 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 culture. no, 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 no. We have, we have uh, more tribes than you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now in Uganda, uh, in Uganda, in Musoka, and when you call it a tissue, we'll have to dress differently when it comes to culture. Long ago, we had uh, our traditional traditional wear, it was the back cloth. Some people actually used to put on banana leaves. You see banana plantations around, the leaves you see on the bananas. Some people used to use them as dresses. Even actually, up to now, you go to some cultures, you go to some regions where you find people. Uh, during their cultural ceremonies, they put on bananas. Some actually walk naked. I've uh, witnessed some people are very Nigeria. Say that. Where can I see people walking naked? I would like to see. I'm not very certain of the country, but it must be Africa. I saw pictures of people of ladies. I don't know whether they are celebrating what kind of family. No, it's South Africa. It's South Africa, right? Yeah, so you can actually see them naked. They only cover their waist. <laughs> so that like, every part of the body is naked and you can actually visualize everything. <laughs> but uh, in Uganda, particularly, we have different cultures. Um, among my colleagues is, uh, is a northerner, so they dress differently when it comes to culture. I'm a central guy. Um, he's a central guy. 
but of different tribes, groups of different tribes, because in central China, different kinds of tribes. Uh, it's a uh, central guy, but the uh, Kusoka, you know, <laughs> it's in Uganda, I don't know whether it happens in other countries, but in Uganda, we, we actually have a lot of uh, fun statements about the Kusoka, and it's literally very, very, very interesting. People laugh about them, but otherwise, that's what we have for, for you guys today. Thank you for the time, thank you for listening, and giving us the opportunity to share with you. Thank you.